for the recording. Uh, thank you once more, Saul, Saul for for, uh, for a very interesting and I would say a refreshing talk, which gives really lots of lots of ideas, lots of things to well to, to think about uh and to comment and if and perhaps also to disagree or to agree uh we will start our first session which is called uh, in fact we decided in our conference to follow at first uh, at, at, at the beginning uh, a kind of chronological order and so we will start with the yiddish translations in the 19th century Affenschwell von einem modernen yiddish uh, and I have a great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, our first speaker, uh, Arnaud Bicard, uh, who is an associate professor in, in Alco in Paris, in the F French Institute uh, for Oriental Languages and Civilizations. Uh, he was also a co, well, quite several months ago, he was also a co-director of the Department of uh, the Hebrew and Jewish studies, and he is an associate, an associate professor, professor there. Uh, uh, he conducts uh, his uh, researches uh, in uh, Yiddish literature, in comparative literature. Um, and uh, uh, just uh, one year ago, he uh, wrote, he published his PhD uh, thesis uh, about a very well-known uh, Yiddish uh, humanist researcher and uh, writer and poet, uh, Elia Levita, uh, which is a very, very, very important work in, in this, in, in new work in this field. Uh, Arnaud Bicard uh, uh, will present a paper about the translation of Pinsker's auto-emancipation by Mendele and the problem of translating into Yiddish at the end of the 19th century. Thank you very much, Valia. Um, I will, uh, I'm very happy this my, my paper comes after uh, Sol's uh, plenary talk. Uh, it is very much linked to it and with, with some contrasts. Um, my talk today takes its origin from the fascination I have felt when meeting for the first time a translation which has very few parallels even in Jewish writings and around which, to my opinion, many questions have been left unanswered which enable to tackle many theoretical problems about translation and Yiddish. I am thinking about Shalom Yankov Abramovich's translation of Pinsker's Proto-Zionist pamphlet, Otto Emancipation, published by the writer. Uh, the, the, the pamphlet was published in German in 1882 in Berlin, but the translation was published in Odessa in 1884, and it was entitled As Gula zu die Jiddische Zores. I will share my presentation so that you can see the uh, front pages of both uh, works. Uh, although the front page of the of uh, Mendeleev's uh, translation is not the original one, uh, I have not uh, had access to to uh, reproduction of it. Uh, it. But you you can see uh, both works here. Uh, the text of Mendeleev is well known although it remains quite marginal among his writing. The translation was first signed Abramovich, not like the one you, you see here, which is a later translation, uh, and not Mendele Moichos Forin, but was later integrated to the complete works of the author under his fictional identity. In the first edition, it was presented on the front page as a translation from the German work. Then its status of translation was reminded only in the prologue. The translation has attracted the attention of the most important Mendel scholars who have mostly insisted on two points. First of all, 
it enables to establish Mendel's sympathy for the Zionist idea, although he has always been very reluctant to all forms of organized militant association. This is Shmuel Niger's stance in his biography of the writer uh, of 1936. And he underlines the fact that this is an adaptation, not a mere translation, which according to him shows how much Mandela had made Pinker's ideas his own. Nachman Meisel in the Mandela book published in 1959 also insists on Mandela's personal involvement with the text, the shortening of many passages and describes his work as a freie Bearbeitung, a free adaptation. The second approach of Mandela's text was proposed by Max Weinreich, who offered in an article of 1942, the most thorough and the most influential analysis of this work. Weinreich defends a somewhat different point of view. As Gula to the Yiddish Tzores, which means a remedy to the Jewish worries, uh, is better called a translation, according to him, than an adaptation. Despite the impression of a great difference between Pinsker's and Mendel's texts, caused by the remarkable change in tonality, Weinreich argues that the Yiddish writer is careful to precisely translate his source. Mendele geht noch dem Inals Fußtritt, Paragraph noch Paragraph, schier nicht Satz noch Satz. Weinreich's article bears the eloquent title Was heißt schreiben Jiddischler? What does it mean to write in a Jewish or in a Yiddish way? Although it is obvious that Abramovich has realized a stylistic tour de force in his rendition of Pinsker's theoretical and highly abstract work, Weinreich argues that his version of auto-emancipation naturally derives from the change of the addressee induced by the change of the language. In his work published in German, the language of the Haskalah in Berlin, the capital of Jewish enlightenment, Pinsker had in mind the highly Europeanized Jewish intellectual who has received a general humanistic education and shares the culture of his Christian contemporaries. Mendele, according to Weinreich, writes for what he calls the base medrash intelligent, the educated Jew from the house of study, the one who knows the subtleties of Talmudic interpretation and whose intellectual faculties do not fall short, fall short from the university taught modern Jew. Weinreich's point of view is based on a far reaching premise. The Yiddish word and the Yiddish language have been fashioned by an important degree of separateness from European mainstream culture. The, relation, the relationship to the ancient word, to philosophy and to the word of thought in general has been fundamentally different by Jews. This is Weinreich's position. Consequently, consequently especially at the end of the 19th century, when the language was still dominantly oral, a real talented translation of a German text demands a lot more work than a translation of the te same text in English, French, or even Russian. In this respect, Weinreich's reading of Mendel's translation is consequent with his insistence as a linguist on the specificity of Yiddish as a Jewish language, deeply imbued with the religious way of life of the Talmud, the Derech Ashas. Weinreich then enumerates a series of stylistic features which characterize Mendel's translation in comparison with Pinsker's text the absence of foreign words or what he calls internationalism, the avoidance of abstract substantives 
and of complex adjectives, the cultivation of orality through the lexicon as well as the syntax. Weinreich's position is very seductive and may be at the same time a little bit deceptive since it postulates in some way a radical difference of the Yiddish style from the styles of other European languages. The eminent scholar goes further than defining the originality of Abramovich's style. He encourages all Yiddish speakers to go to school by Mendele, gained by him in Heide. In other words, to cultivate the otherness, the Yiddishness of their Yiddish. Marking Yiddish, underlying its difference, is an option which Weinreich strongly advocates in 1942. I will bring a quotation here uh, of Weinreich. Basam in Gang von halten sich, was nennt er zu der natürlicher eingewachsener Sprache, ist gewiss nicht mehr wie gleich zu nützen jene emotionelle, befarb, emotionell befarbene Zugo Bertler, was er jed von der ganz Jahr flecht herein in seine Rede. Mischtens gesagt, neber, cholile, boch Hashem, beobwohnen wir sein Nichts dos da gemändele mit der breiter Hand. Was kenn es im Aaren, was bei Pinskeren in deutschen Original ist dos nicht to. Solle Deutsch, wenn er wird Wellen übersetzen in sein Sprach, a Kapitel Kletsche, dem soll Zugo Wertler a Reuslose. We can see uh, the way Weinreich illustrates his. Uh, his point of speaking and writing an oral Yiddish and a, a, a vivid and a, a lively one. Um, but it's also, uh, and as we can see from this quotation, this point of view as the point of view of Weinreich has consequences not only on the style of Yiddish writing, but also maybe on the way one should translate Yiddish literary works, allowing more or less of this Yiddishness to transpire into other European languages. But it is also important to note that Weinreich's willingly mass maximalist position deserves to be qualified in some way. It is firstly interesting to compare, to compare Mendel's Yiddish translation with the one of Mem Bleistift, published in Lodge in 1917, and which Norman Meisel described as pink, pinkler, faithful, accurate. Let's see, let's take a look at those different uh, translations. I'm sorry for the various colors that might look very confusing, but I think you can see where what was translated through the with what through the different colors. And what is very interesting to to compare, uh, if we take uh, Weinreich's position that uh, Mendel's uh, translation is Yiddishler, that will mean that the translation, which is not Meisel's translation, it's, it's a, a, a translation of, of that Meisel uh, quotes, uh, is not Yiddish, uh, which is problematic since it's a Yiddish translation. Uh, in what, what can we see? We can see, first of all, we can see that uh, the accurate, the faithful translation of Bleistift is not that accurate. That, I, that is that maybe the adaptation, the evolution of uh, the Yiddish language, which uh, Weinreich uh, himself says has uh, helped to translate more, uh, to, to use internationalism and all those things is not complete in, there is still a difference. The Judenfrage is 
translated the Azoi Gerufene Yiden Frage. Of course, we are very much closer than the uh, the beginning of Mendel, von Ewige Jahren bis auf Heintigen Tod, tut sich a ganze Welt Menschen dem Kopf mit der stark alter Rettenisch. Das ist die jeden Frage bei Mendel. And of course, by Mendel, we have everything that Weinreich puts forward. We have an avoidance of abstract terms. We have uh, the, the, the language and the vocabulary of the of the Talmud Chochem. Um, but we have also some things that Weinreich doesn't really take into account. We have a use of metaphors and the use of uh, illustrations. The metaphors are very concrete. They, they can be related to the oral language, but they are actually much more than that. They are a deep transfer, stylistic transformation. And which means that it is not only the change of address which is here important, it is a stylistic project. And that's what I'm going to try to show. Um, what we see in the, in the newer translation are uh, the internationalism. Uh, you see uh, by Pinsker, kein bloß theoretisches Interessen, he's translating nicht nur a theoretischen Interesse, which was by Mendel, weil das ist nicht wie in Lernen etwas Hauptstickel, was ist glatter Säusig, noch auf a Ballones, gede zu treffen, der von dem Pschat. Das ist theoretisch bei Mendel. Das ist uh, this is really a uh, 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 stylistical feat, and th this should be really underlined. Um, let's uh, go further. I cannot add the analyze. I will show you another uh, part of the of both translation. If you want to have a look, I, I don't really have time to to analyze them uh, precisely. Um, this doesn't account what Weinreich uh, tells us for most of the differences. As Gula to the Yiddish Tzores is such a unique translation because it has to be placed in the frame of the stylistic experiments that the writer Abramovich was making in his novels through the 1870s and the 1880s, and which were aptly described by Dan Miron in in his uh, A Travel of Disguise. It's an extreme realization of the Nusach Mendel, this folksy tone bridging the gap between the European, Europeanized writer Abramovich and the common Yiddish speaking Jew that the writer elaborated in the successive version of his novels, and which was to have such a momentous influence on the development of Yiddish literature. There's a certain dose of humor in this translation, which cannot be totally neglected and which is voluntarily overlooked in Weinreich's reading. That is why the very foreign sounding title of Pinker's work, Auto Emancipation, with its Greek and Latin roots, has been turned into the quite deceptive title of a typical work of folklore, as Gula to the Yiddish Atzores. This is the reason of the sense of modernity that strikes when we read this translation. But this is above all a brilliant exception, which does not reflect the role and ambition of Yiddish translation at the end of the 19th century. When the de generation of Abramovich, but also of Sholom Aleichem and Yud Lamed Peretz engage in Yiddish literature, Yiddish had still recently detached from the symbiotic polysystem, in the words of Itamar Ibn Zohar, that linked it to Hebrew. For centuries, both languages had had complementary functions, and Hebrew was in general the language of abstraction, of philosophical and theological reflection. In this field and in many others, one can remind Peretz's famous complex in his poem Monish on the poverty of the Yiddish language in matters of romantic love. Yiddish power of expressing reality was felt as deficient. 
One of the means to expand the realm of Yiddish writing was from the beginning calls for translations from European literature. And Abramovich was in this field, as in others, a path breaker. In 1869, he offered with the collaboration of his friends Lamed Binstock, a translation of Jules Verne's debut novel, Cinq Semaines en Ballon, under the title Der Luftballon, of which Norman Meiser wrote that 75 years later, it could still serve as a stylistic model. This translation, which predated most of Abram Abramovich's literary achievements, can be seen as the contrary of his Pinsker's translation. The aim, here, the aim here is not to make a German text as Yiddish as possible, but on the contrary, to European, Europeanize and to modernize Yiddish prose. This explains the choice of this French novel on an exotic topic, talking about African landscapes and modern technology. In the 1860s, Mendele was still following the agenda of a maskil, translating into Hebrew scientific works from German. He shortens Jules Verne's works, keeping many pages dealing to us abstractly on, uh, um, with scientific or geopolitical issues. But most interestingly, this translation is far away from, that, from what will distinguish Mendele's later prosaic style, his cultivation of orality, the richness, the richness of his dialogues, his humorous tone. On the contrary, it eliminates most of Jules Verne's dialogues and jokes to concentrate on the narration of the adventurous story. One can say that this translation is a pre-Mendele work, and he, when uh, Mendele uh, was to become himself, he renounced to such translation, although he kept it because he still meant it had a, a, a value. As a whole, Yiddish translation seems to face a conundrum at the end of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century. The calls to enrich Yiddish prose through translation are numerous, but the development of an independent original Yiddish literature requires a concentration on the word of the shtetl and on the linguistic specificity of the Yiddish language. Reviewing two translations of Krilov's fables into Yiddish, Sholem Aleichem writes in a 1888, that many mediocre writers would be better inspired to contribute to the development of the Yiddish language by translating foreign works instead of trying their pen on original fictions. Two decades later, Chaim Zitlovsky does pretty much the same call and says he would happily sacrifice most of modern Yiddish literature to have good translations of the best Western works. And I will show you Zitlovsky's translation. I think I have to go quickly. Übersetzungen, MS gute rein jiddische von die reichste Werk von der Menschheit wollten mit dem Moll abgerahmt von der Welt die Frage wegen der jiddischer Sprachohrenkeit und wollten im ganzen Fachsport und den Künstler jene mir, welche Musik anwenden, oft zu beschaffen oder entdecken dem nötigen jüdischen Ausdruck. Die Hevle Lede von der Sprache wollte man in ganzen gekonnt übergeben dem Übersetzer. Und ob der Maler Gabriel wollte bei Emes aufgestellt von mir die Alternative oder Übersetzungen oder eigenem schaffen auf der istiger Madrege, wollt ihr errege nicht gequenkelt sich und wollt fest erreus getrogen Mansardin Übersetzungen. This strange competition between original creation and translation is linked to a broader feeling. Until pretty late, the development of a prosaic style detached from the natural milieu of Yiddish life has seemed relatively unnatural. Thus, 
the first translation and adaptation at the end of the 19th century have been made by popular writers and adaptators. In the 1890s, Perez, Sholem Aleichem, and Spector mostly published in their literary journals translations of Russian, Polish, and German works, which describe the lives of Russian and Galician Jews. It seems not until the 20th century that Yiddish writers such as Leon Kobrin and Yeo Hash have set their mind to translate major foreign works. To conclude, Mendel's translation of Pinsker's work enables by its originality to understand the difficulty of devising a natural prosaic style in Yiddish at the end of the 19th century, in particular because of the oral nature of the language. The conquest of European literature was a long process, which was still very actual in the re revolutionary years of 1970-1990, as Kenneth Smalt has demonstrated. This study of some 19th century translation is also relevant to our understanding of more general problems of translation. Since the Yiddish style has been consciously fashioned during the first decade, Toussaint Yiddishler, as Weinreich puts it, does this entail some particular issues for the translation of those same works? So should the Russian, the French, the English, the German translators throw away the emotional phrases of the original Yiddish text, as Weinreich suggested with a bit of provocation? This original story invites us, on the contrary, to make the translation more Yiddishler in order not to erase these essential qualities of Yiddish prose. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arno, for this fascinating presentation. Uh, please, yes, <laughs> please, um, questions, commentaries. Raise your hands. So yes, please, uh, Mindo, go ahead. Thank you, Arno. Um, I think you were saying this, but but maybe not. So I want to ask. I I feel that as though you were suggesting that the translation process, the act of translating this essay, maybe gives Abramovich a different opportunity, a better challenge to test out the Nusach Mendele then original writing does, that there's something different when we're acting within the constraints of translation than creative writing. So I'm curious if that's, were you saying that? Or, or if not, do you agree that there's something about the constraint of translation that's productive um, for, for this stylistic? Yeah, I, I think you're definitely right. I think, I think the, um, uh, the strange thing about this, uh, this uh, translation of Pinsker is that uh, the playfulness uh, that we can see in the development uh, through the novels of the, of the, the style, the Mandela, the Nusach Mandela, uh, is taken to, to some kind of extreme there. And then what, what, uh, uh, what uh, bothered me with Weinreich's uh, article was his, uh, um not considering at all the the quite the, the 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 hidden irony of such a translation the hidden uh tongue in cheek when someone uh, translate theoreticus with a stem of balones on azel khazar it's impossible not to see this and uh and I think you're right with the, with the translation, uh, with, with the question of translation. I think Mendel was, uh, he was the, his whole career inspired by translation. We know very well that when he wanted to translate uh, Vinschwingel into Hebrew, first he had the, the Yiddish original, so it was easy for him. And afterwards, when he didn't have any more this Yiddish original, he was stuck. So he had to write the, the, the end of the Yiddish version in order to finish the Hebrew one. Uh, so I, I, I think very much his, his, his creation process was continuous uh, uh, translation. And I think it, it, it reached some very 
uh, fascinating results in this is this translation. What fascinates me it has, is, is that it is so early. It's, it's 1884. It's before everything uh, in modern Yiddish literature was written nearly. And, and it, it, it sounds so, so, so modern. Thank you very much, Arnaud. Uh, in fact, we have not so, not so much time, but just short questions and short answers, and then you can discuss it later in, in the yeah. discussion. Uh, yeah. So Valery Dimschitz uh, raised, yes, rose his hand. But but you are you are muted, please. Can you yes? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure that is a question. It's some sort of a disagreement. Uh, you start. Thank you first of all. Thank you for wonderful Arno. Thank you for wonderful uh, paper. Very fruitful. Very interesting. Very problematic. My uh, disagreement is that you started that in the early period. Yiddish had no uh, instruments for presentation, uh, abstract and theoretical subjects at all, yes? Uh, uh, I think that very much in this strange uh, and very, very artistic translation of Mandela is the result not of a, uh, some lack of instruments in Yiddish, but the specific artistic nature of uh, Mandela Abramovich who was the man who made some sort of a literature play from all his life. Uh, one brief sample. In 1904, uh, Ginsburg, Saul, uh, Saul Ginsburg invited Mandele to join, uh, the, and send, uh, to join uh, him and send some something, some text uh, to the new founded uh, newspaper Der Freund in, in, Peter, in Petersburg, yeah, in Petersburg. Uh, of course, Ginsburg wrote his formula letter, very correct, very, uh, uh, very official in Russian. Mandela Abramovich, uh, and Ginsburg started, Milostivy Gosudari Abramovich, la 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 la. Mandela answered, also in Russian, very correct, absolutely normal, very formula, uh, very canonic, very... Um, very, very formula. Nils Livogusudari, Ginsburg, my Nelosovar friend, Azoy Weiter, and so on in, in Russian. I sent your, I translated your letter for my friend Mendele. And the second half of the letter was written in Yiddish, very idiomatic, full of different uh, characteristic emotional expressions typical for the style of Mendele. So this. His creativity as a play, as a different rules, uh, play with a different stylistic and so on and so on. It was the principle of his life and his creativity. And he, the translation you showed us now looked very much uh, even uh, parodic or some sort of an anecdote. It's full of humor. Uh, mm -hmm. Or we, we have to believe that it was a very, very specific uh, extreme, uh, we may see even avant-garde experiment. Yeah, I, I, I pretty much the agree. Lack of instrument. It, I, he, he did what he did. Yeah, I very much agree with what you said, but I still, I still remain convicted that there was a a, a, a feeling of uh, of a, a lack or a, a not compatibility of Yiddish with some subjects, and uh, I could elaborate on this. Uh, we don't really have time, but if you see, uh, I, I invite you to consider how Plato, for example, was translated into Hebrew and how at the same time Plato was translated into Yiddish. Uh, it's just uh, fascinating because those are the same Jews from the same places, but in Hebrew they could do it and they did it and in Yiddish others they couldn't, others they didn't dare to do it and it took, it, it never really was achieved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valeria Dimschitz and uh, Arnaud Arno Bicar. Uh, Saul, I saw I, I saw that you had a question, but uh, can I please ask you to to just just later? You will you know we will have a discussion later. Is it okay? Thank you very much because now we have uh, 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 we have uh, more presentations, and uh, I would like to to give the word to uh, Mikhail Lukin. Um, he 
focuses uh, his his researches on Jewish East European historic and ethnomusicology. His PhD dissertation was entitled The Yiddish Folk Song, Poetics and Music uh, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, where in this dissertation, he provided a frame of reference for the characterization of Yiddish folk folk singing. Uh, currently, uh, uh, Mikhail Lukim is a Warburg uh, postdoctoral fellow at uh, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and he is uh, also a lecturer uh, at both uh, Barilan University and at uh, Sapir Academic College. Um, Mikhail, uh, please, uh, the title of the presentation is Functions of Translation in Folk Paraphrases on Psalm 118. Thank you, Valentina, for this introduction. Can you hear me and can you see my um, presentation? Great. Okay, so. I would like to discuss songs that combine Hebrew biblical verses and their renderings into Yiddish and the local languages. And then such an arrangement, the translation doesn't exist as an independent text, which supersedes the original, but rather as a means of expression that acts only alongside the source. It doesn't serve as a tool for clarifying the meaning of the words, ideas, or general spirit of the source, nor does it convey any social message. Instead, it serves primarily to call for reflection. This device allows the performing community to concentrate on both the poetic message and the meaning of the Yiddish speakers, multilingualism, as they themselves perceive it. My conclusion emerges from a consideration of the poetic texts performance, contexts, and music. In Ashkenazi culture, the function of translation is one of the most significant differences between multilingual folk songs and bilingual literary texts. Um, multilingual religious folk songs occupy the central place in the two pioneering collections of folk songs of Eastern Yiddish speakers, one edited by Scholl Ginsburg and Pesach Marek, and the other edited by Noach Prilutsky. These editors viewed such songs as the core repertoire representing the Yiddish folk poetry. The blending of languages was seen as their most salient and fascinating characteristic. I am aware of eight different versions of the song that we will hear now from Lithuania in the north to Romania in the south. And its wide distribution, multiple differences between the versions and especially the variety of melodies to which it is sung indicate that the song has circulated in Ashkenazi culture for a long time. The performance context of such songs are anchored in rites of passage, the end of Seder night, end of Shabbos, Yorzeit, and the Simchas um, in yellow are translations into English from Hebrew and Russian. Uh, in each strophe, the verse from Psalm 118 is rendered into Yiddish, and these Yiddish words are then translated into Russian. That is, the Russian words are not a translation from the source, but a translation of a translation. Uh, now I will try to play the audio example, and if you don't hear, please, please uh, write me in the chat. <laughs> Don't I don't I don't 
хочу умирать, хочу я жить. Донай, 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 хочу я Богу похвалить. Дунай, дунай, дун. Я суил и сранико, дунай, дунай, дунай. Вейла мове слейны сонони, дунай, дунай, дунай. Штрогов мих и год и ви. Дунай, 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 но тум тейт береги мир не иже. Дунай, 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 но тум тейт береги мир не иж. Дунай, дунай, дун. Карай мне Бог, что сколь Дунай, 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 только и к смерти мне не давай, Дунай, Дунай, Дун, только и к смерти мне не давай, Дунай, Дунай, Дун. The melody of this song doesn't differ from hundreds other Jewish tunes, so it couldn't be perceived as a musical marker of the Gentile culture. Therefore, the song is not about the so-called redemption of the sparks of non-Jewish music. It's not a contrafact. Noach Prelutsky identified religious fervor as a reason for the inclusion of different languages. The religious fervor is undoubtedly salient here, and yet it is clear that the combination of languages is not a product of a spontaneous emotion. Rather, the song is learned by heart and performed repeatedly, being anchored in stable traditional structure. The same structure has been discovered in other multilingual religious songs as well. It is therefore clear that the integration of languages represents a traditional pattern and not a mystical momentary breaking of the limits and laws of language. Thus, it is appropriate to agree partially with Prelutsky and to admit that uh, religious mystical fervor is one of the reasons for the integration of languages. However, the function of translation in them is not to spontaneously create an ecstatic religious atmosphere, but rather to amplify the religious message and feeling through the amplification of the lingual possibilities of the singer. Another reason for the integration of the translation, identified by Moshe Berigovsky in 1930, is the organization of the text, multiplication. Thanks to the translations, a handful of verses becomes a long and developed song, and the refrain, whose meaning is unclear, unites its various parts. In 1928, Joseph Goldberg noticed that translations were mainly present in religious songs. Indeed, although there are some non-religious songs built up of text and translation, there are very few, maybe two or three, and they don't contain any Hebrew element. Most translation songs, about 15 in the documentation known to me, include a Hebrew element and religious contents. This fact requires an explanation. If Yiddish speakers had adopted the compositional device as an accepted poetic pattern, we would have found many more songs of all kinds organized in this way. Goldberg uh, contextualized these religious songs as an Ashkenazi parallel to the European macaronic humorous poetry of the late medieval and early modern periods. Two terms coined by Mikhail Bakhtin, heteroglossia and carnivalesque contribute to our understanding of the non-satirical humor in multilingual paraphrases. 
Indeed, as I mentioned, these religious songs are performed in contexts marked by liminality, rites of passage, the rituals of the end of the Seder, Moitzi Shabbos, and the end of the year, Simchestere, are uh, characterized by weakening the voice of the elite, a cultural phenomenon termed by Bakhtin Carnivalesque. According to him, the Carnivalesque practices allow for an encounter between different linguistic points of view on the world, that is the heteroglossia. And such an encounter is also reflected in the tune of our song. It is both joyful and dramatic. In addition, the words and the melody testify to the collective performance. These songs were performed in a responsive manner. The singer sang the lyrics and the audience responded with a refrain of Dune Dune. The collective performance and musical characteristics reveal a clear affinity to a collective celebration of a rite of passage. In this context, we should recall that the tradition of macaronic songs incorporating verses from the Alel prayer, including Psalms uh, 118, is documented from the early 17th century until recently. Such macaronic songs are found, for example, in the so-called uh, Valich manuscript published by Diana Matut, as well as in the example documented by Max Grunwald in 18, uh, 1898. However, some other characteristics reveal that the uh, trilingual paraphrase that we have just heard represents an idiosyncratic Eastern Ashkenazi Carnivalesque, and that the integration of languages fulfills a different function here beyond creating, uh, creating a comic effect. First, the three texts in Hebrew, Yiddish, and Russian are sung in our paraphrase to the same melody and unified by the same refrain. Therefore, the tension between the different languages is weakened. Moreover, the translation from Yiddish into Russian does not introduce innovations. The Russian text doesn't contradict the Yiddish one, but rather strengthens it. Finally, unlike the two previous examples, the paraphrase that we heard doesn't contain any comic macaronic lingual puns. Although the gap in the contrast between the sublime text and its uh, inaccurate rendering do create a certain humorous effect, the theme of the struggle with death, with, which the translation emphasizes, and the dramatic tone of the singing both require us not to settle for humor as the sole explanation for the integration of languages. The clear order and structure are remoted from Bakhtin's concept of the Carnivalesque. Since this is not a humorous Carnivalesque song, we must uncover another meaning for the combination of Yiddish and Russian. In search for an additional function comes out, um, uh, excuse me, the search for an additional function comes out of the question asked by Joseph Goldberg. Why are most of the songs that contain the three languages religious? Or as I indicated above, if Yiddish speakers were accustomed to integrating translation as a formal tool or a tool for reinforcing the message, why is this pattern less common in non-religious songs? Um, Robert Rochstein and Diana Matut pointed to various multilingual European non-Jewish repertoires related to Christmas and other Christian festivities. And historically, Yiddish religious trilingual paraphrases might be related to these practices. And still, Goldberg's question requires a consideration of the semiotic aspects. An answer may be found in observing non-religious songs that contain a translation, as well as a close examination of the paraphrase of Psalm 118. The two songs in front of us, one non-Jewish. Uh, can you see my pointer, by the way? Yeah, great, thank you. One non-Jewish and one Yiddish-Russian are typologically close to the trilingual paraphrase uh, on Psalms. The trilingual song has a uniform refrain, tra -la -la, appearing in the middle of the strophe and at its end. And the words in different languages here in the Yiddish bilingual song are sung to the same melody. Now, researchers, researchers have shown that such songs appear in areas where multilingual encounters take place. 
and that these songs function mainly as the group identity markers, because only those who comprehend the language can sing them, or alternatively, as uh, markers of crossing lingual barriers. Such songs have the potential to involve broader audiences who join the singing even without full comprehension of the foreign language. Um, these functions do not fit in the sounds paraphrase. Unlike these examples, designation of either speaker's group identity does not call for Russian. And it is also clear that the paraphrases of sounds do not aim to involve a non-Jewish audience. In other words, the social function of translation in the multilingual paraphrases is limited. The poetic function, different from those I mentioned earlier, is revealed from the emphasis on the personal dimension and from the traditional setting. The song is performed over and over within a community that already knows the text and therefore does not need a translation. The Yiddish rendering of the biblical verses involves a significant deviation from the original. And this deviation is emphasized in the second translation into Russian. For example, in the first stanza, the, the auxiliary verb vil is rendered as wish and not as well of the future tense. In the second stanza, the deviation from the direct meaning of the source derives from a misinterpretation of the infinitive absolute, which is interpreted as an imperative. Do punish me. Yasor Yesrani, do punish me. Instead of intensification of the action, the correct translation would be, of course, he punished me severely. Um, the focus on the individual opposed to the canonical translation is also revealed by comparing with numerous translations of the Hallel prayer. The prayer is recited at every holiday and is included in the Haggadah, so there is no doubt that the common translation was familiar to all. The early Yiddish translations rely on Russia's interpretation according to which these verses could not have been said by King David since he is known to be dead. Therefore, it is clear that this is the people of Israel who will never die and will continue to live as a witness to God's actions. The folk rendering, on the other hand, emphasizes the debate with death just before the retreat to the next world. It has no canonic national dimension, but only personal perspective. Another feature created by the translation is the song's serial structure. Thanks to a constant combination of double translation after each verse, the logical sequence of the original is broken and the catalog-like enumerating setting emerges. The personal encounter with the translation to the, have been the transition to the next world is described here from A to Z in detail in three languages. The enumeration enhances the focus on the personal voice. It is now juxtaposed to all encompassing panoramic view. This is how the integration of multiple translations create the antithetical par parallelism. The sole voice of Ich is contrasted to the image of the entire universe as represented by all possible languages, the holy tongue, the everyday mother tongue, Yiddish and the foreign Russian. The antithetical parallelism is at the heart of the poetic function of translation, highlighting the focus on the poetic message rather than on the context and uh, the audience. Such parallelism suits the liminal context of the performance of the translation paraphrases and their main topic, clarification of the fundamental questions of human existence. In conclusion, we will listen to another short recording this time from the South. The translation again represents a folk interpretation of verses from Psalms. The intonation and the form of the melody combine joy and drama. This version like the previous one juxtaposes a personal quality and the universal trend. And here too, the translation functions as an aesthetic tool and as part of the song's content. О, в домни, домни, 
О, в дом не дом не, я сыры сранил. О, в дом не дом не, я сыры сранил. О, в дом не дом не, ой. Веламу веслой носу ну не, о, в дом не дом не. Веламу веслой носу ну не, о, в дом не дом не. Что в мир год мы двусти вели, что в дом не дом не. Что в мир год мы двусти вели, что в дом не дом не. Ой, норцем той где мехни, что в дом не дом не. Норцем той где мехни, что в дом не дом не. Бати мы дем на дюку чивраю, в дом не дом не. Бати мы дем на дюку чивраю, в дом не дом не. Оф. Nu me la morte să nu mai dai, o, vă, domnie, doamne, nu me la morte să nu mai dai, o, vă, domnie, doamne. To sum up, in the folk paraphrases of Psalm 118 and other songs based on a pattern of translation, its dominant function is poetic, more so than social or referential. Religious songs anchored in a multilingual pattern are usually performed at times marked by liminality and depict an individual at a crossroads. The combination of sacred text and vernacular languages creates the antithetical parallelism in which the image of the universe is juxtaposed to the individual singing voice. The use of translation as a poetic device is in this light an expression of traditional East Ashkenazi aesthetic thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for this great recording and also for a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Well, please, questions, comments, frages, commentaren, leader. What was the last language of translation? Moldavian. Moldavian, thanks. Beautiful. And am I right that the, the language of translation, Moldavian, influenced the, the refrain, the domni? Domni, yes. Because it, I think there is an influence of, of the like Romanian, Moldavian language in it. Not Dunai, but domni. Exactly. Thank you for this comment, and which, which means God, because Dunai is, of course, uh, a river, yeah. Ah, yes. So it's like an, in in opposition. Yes, yes. Not to be not to be mixed up with a river. Ah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Please, please, uh, uh, Saul. Um. Does the order have a meaning of some kind that you can? I know you said it's not hierarchical, but is there like a chronological? mode to it or like what does it mean that the foreign language is the last one and at least in these recordings the one that is most confidently articulated meaning that when you're repeating the meaning over and over again the last one is the one that is the most familiar in some sense is that is that true is there in this repetition are you sort of um is it you know moving towards the universal as you said or is it about becoming more familiar in some sense and that the final language would be the one that the audience would actually know the best in some way thank you for this question in fact i haven't thought about earlier but not uh, prelutsky um, noticed that most of the informants make mistakes with the foreign language so they they remember that they should think, uh, sing we in, in some Russian also, but they don't uh, actually recall the words. And the same I, when I was looking for different uh, audio recordings in the, the sound archive of the National Library of Israel, uh, there are several versions, but informants say, okay, it goes also in Ukrainian, but the Ukrainian words I don't remember now, that this is why I would sing only in Hebrew and Yiddish. And uh, that was his reason for uh, declining the theory that uh, the songs are a product of uh, assimilation, of lingual assimilation. They, are, were, they were sung for Jews um, and not for Russians. And the Russian language has only a symbolic uh, function here. 
Thank you. Uh, Hannah Kronfeld has also a question, please. Thank you very much for this um, fascinating um, kind of um, Jacobsonian analysis. I particularly like the way in which you link up um, the tradition of uh, textual translation as interpretation, the, the principle in rabbinic literature and beyond of Shnai Mikra Vechatorgum to kind of a recipe, two parts Hebrew, uh, one part whatever Jewish language it's translated in with a poetic and expressive function, right? If, you, if we're talking Jacobson, uh, but also um, the triangulation is fascinating because the traditional model is bilingual, right? Um, but here, uh, how do you um, account for that meeting of, right, of the trilingual poetic and expressive with the traditional uh, kind of Hebrew plus translation as interpretation into a Jewish language? Thank you. This is the, the main point of this presentation. Actually, um, we have more songs in uh, three or four languages. And this is the, the question, why do we need all these vernacular non-Jewish non languages? Uh, I can see here my teacher, Professor Edwin Sarusi, who wrote an article and another about another paraphrase in four languages um, performed um, at the Moitze Shabbos which has a um, um, uh, Hebrew piyut, a Yiddish translation, and then language of birds, which um, rhymes to the words of the piyut, and then uh, Polish language. And the question is, what, what, why do we need all this, uh, tri this trilingual, um, trilingual model? So that was my explanation that this is not about uh, interpretation and not about uh, commentary on the contents, but um, something, uh, just a poetic function. And it happens only uh, in- Why can't it be both? You know, clearly the meaning of, uh, and the tradition of Taich, right? And of, of uh, translation, interlineal translation as interpretation does not go away, it is included and then added to it, right here. I, I think the either or is, um, is where I'm, I, I get stuck a little bit with your account. So you, if I understand you correctly, you emphasize that uh, there are several functions and the, also interpretation and the other functions, I agree. This is again another concept of Jacobson uh, of dominant. I think that- Exactly, the... exactly. Yeah. I agree with you. Thank you for this clarification. Thank you very much. Sharon, I thought you, you had a, a small question, short question. Yes, ah, yes, you. Yeah, it is a small question. Um, I was just wondering, because I don't speak um, Russian or any other uh, Slavic language, um, how correct uh, the, the foreign versions are and whether um, there is any uh, difference in style, uh, for example, compared to the Yiddish. Thank you. Uh, there are mistakes in Russian and I think also in uh, Romanian because I asked both speakers of Romanian and of Moldovan, and uh, everybody said this is the other one. <laughs> so I think uh, it's not uh, very precise. And um, he did make some mistake in, um, in Russian. He, he, you could hear it. He, instead of сколько ты хочешь, что, ah, no, сколько ты хочешь. So he, he couldn't remember precisely the words, and they, but it's kind of uh, Russian, not Ukrainian or Belarusian. It's a high language of the Russian Empire. So, yeah. He has also some problems with uh, Yiddish dialects, which is uh, he he sings something yeah. Lithuanian in a Lithuanian manner, and then he, he switches into like club okay. Ukrainian. General, yeah, yeah. But um, I I believe that the northern dialect is his uh, own because he comes from yeah, and then. Maybe he sang the song for his friend uh, in New York. So, yeah. Uh, Arno, 
I have a small question. I don't know if I have time. Yeah. <laughs> My question is, is the following. Um, I was uh, wondering um, when uh, you have so many languages, you have Hungarian, you have Romanian, and uh, and do you do are there some writing from the Chassidim or from the religious uh, about this uh, idea of of, of, of speaking foreign, a foreign tongue. Uh, do you know about, about something, about a, a religious perspective on this? Yes, this was the first explanation suggested by uh, both Prilutsky and Goldberg, that uh, I think uh, Goldberg identified this, uh, applying to foreign languages, uh, Pinas Asov. Uh, the Hasidic um, concept of uh, being like the goyim to mm. to achieve some more maybe sincerity or some more religious and true feeling. Uh, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure this is uh, the case because because it's so well structured, and I'm not sure the all these songs are really Hasidic. They. Mm -hmm. They come from different areas. We 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 heard uh, Chabad uh, Hasid the first version, but the uh, Romanian uh, informant was not a Hasid. So I'm not sure this is a Hasidic um, um, custom, but rather an older um, tradition. Thank you very much, Mikhail Lukin, and I hope we'll, we can continue our discussion a little bit later today also. And uh, we have our uh, third presenta presenter, uh, Tal Hever Chibovsky, who is also a co-organizer of the conference. He is a director of the, well, uh, Center of the Yiddish Culture in Paris, Madam Library. He's also a founder uh, and a editor in chief of the Hebrew journal Mikan, Mikan Veilach in Berlin. Uh, this is a journal devoted to the diasporic studies. Um, uh, his areas of research include uh, diasporism, uh, Jewish history, Yiddish philology, and also conceptual history and the modern reception of antiquity. He is also a translator of scientific works uh, from Yiddish into Hebrew. And uh, Tal will present us a paper uh, entitled Yosef Meyer Yavetz, la voila, uh, the MyTech. Thank you so much, Valentina. And let's move on to the paper itself. In an article from 1947 entitled Der Goen, wait a second. Yeah. Der Goen von Ivretaich, the genius of Ivretaich. Moshe Starkman has tried to reclaim for Yosef Meir Yavetz his due place in the history of modern Yiddish literature. Starkman writes, in the period in which the modern Yiddish literature began, the second half of the 19th century, at the same time of the Yiddish classics Mendeley and Linetsky, Denison and Spector, Sholem Aleichem and Peretz, there was also the creatively productive genius of modern Ivretaich, Reb Yosef Meir Yavetz. His Ivretaich works around 35 volumes are such a great achievement, literarily and linguistically, that Yavetz deserves to be placed in one group together with the main builders of modern Yiddish literature." End of quote. Yet, despite the monumental corpus produced by Yavetz of Yiddish translations, Ivretaich, for some of the most classical Jewish books, or Sforim, and despite the great popularity and wide circulation of his works, some of which continue to be, to be reprinted today by orthodox publishers, Josef Meir Yavitz's name has been largely forgotten. His biography remains obscure, and his works have received so far very little scholarly attention. The present contribution is a first step towards filling this lacuna. Josef Meir Yavitz was born on February 19th, 18. 32 in Tiktim, to a prestigious Jewish-Lithuanian family of renowned rabbis and Talmudic scholars. Through his paternal grand, grandma, grandfather, sorry, he descended directly from the Maharal, from his paternal grandmother, from the Maharai, the Rema, and the Maharsha. His father, Shmuel Yitzchok, an erudite Jew, 
also knew several European languages. His mother was the daughter of Rabbi, of Rabbi Hillel Finkelstein of Alexot, that's in Kaunas. After her death, Shmuel Yitzchok, the father, remarried and moved from Tiktin to Vilnius in about 1840, where he enjoyed both wealth and prestige. His prominent position as a community leader in Vilnius has earned Shmuel Yitzchok a place in the Hebrew biographical lexicon Ir Vilne from 1900, which included three, which includes 300 of Vilnius' most prominent Jews. The father did not take his eight years old son Yosef Meir with him to Vilnius, and according to Zalman Reisen's lexicon, Yosef Meir was raised by his paternal grandfather, Moshe Zev Wolf Ben Eliezer of Grodno. Grodne, an author of a number of sforim and a rabbi first in Tiktin and later in Bialystok. This biographical detail, however, which was copied by later bio-bibliographers, raises a chronological problem. Yosef Meir was born more than a year after the death of his grandfather, Moishe Zev Wolf, in 1829. Sorry, not yet. Uh, the, uh, the inaccurate detail about Yosef Meyer growing up with his grandfather, which has been extrapolated to speculative proportions by Moishe Starkman, probably stems from the biographical notes that Zalman Reisen received for his lexicon from Shloime Zalman Yavetz, Yosef Meir's grandson. According to Shloime Zalman, Yavetz was an excellent Talmudic scholar, but did not wish to become a rabbi. He married Sore Hadasse, the daughter of Meshulam Zalman Epstein Halevi, an erudite, erudite and honorable resident of Grodne, and tried his luck as a merchant. In 1861, the couple had a son, Israel Iser, who would later become the rabbi of Chuyabyeshov. The couple divorced the same year, and Yosef Meyer, at the age of 20, 29, moved to Warsaw, in which he spent the remaining 53 years of his life. His son, Israel Iser, stayed in Grodne and grew up with his father at, uh, with his mother, sorry, at her father's house. This is probably the reason for the biographical mistake. In Warsaw, Yavetz remarried, had at least one daughter from his second wife, and started to work as a proofreader, Megie. In 1872, he was praised by his ex for his excellent proofreading and great erudition by his employer, the prominent Hebrew printer Yitzchok Goldman, whose printing house in Warsaw at the time was deemed the largest Jewish printing house in the city. By 1900, Yavitz was described in a footnote in Ir Vilna from the same biographical lexicon I showed you before, as the chief proofreader in Warsaw, Hamagia Harashi Bevasha. Alongside his work as a proofreader, Yavetz also excelled as a preacher, holding sermons in Warsaw's biggest synagogues. Both of these occupations, however, were eclipsed by his main undertaking. According to Shloime Zalman, his grandfather was occupied for most hours of the day in translating the Mishnah, Ein Yaakov, Midrash Rabbah, Rashi, Chok Israel and others for him into Yiddish. It was thanks to his translations of the classical rabbinical literature, Zalman Reisen claims that Yavetz acquired his fame, quote, in the Orthodox world, end of quote. Between 1876 and 1880, he published six volumes in Yiddish of the Mishnah, a translation seamlessly intertwining Bartenura's classical commentary from the 15th century. In an essay on translations of Jewish books into Yiddish from 1934, Hillel Zeitlin reports a conversation he overheard many years ago between two erudite Jews debating over the legitimacy of Yavetz's translation of the, Mishnah, of the Mishnah. The first was disapproving. Every ignorant, he claimed, could take the Mishnah in Ivretaj a Chayi Odem in Ivretaj, a Medrash in Ivretaj, and turn into a perfect scholar. 
And what if he indeed becomes a scholar, answers his friend, by all means, let him become a scholar. The Torah was given to everyone. At any rate, Yavetz's Ivre title of the Mishnah soon became the base of his reputation as a translator. And on the title pages of subsequent translations, he was often credited as Yosef Meir Yavetz Maite Kamishnayes, translator of the Mishnah. Now let's speak about Maitek or Ma'atik in modern Israeli pronunciation. This is the pre-modern Hebrew term for translator, originally originating in the Hebrew scientific vocabulary developed in medieval Spain and Provence. Etymologically, it means one who moves something from one place to another. According to Eliezer Ben Yehuda's dictionary, it was first used to describe, quote, the sages of the Talmud who transferred and transmitted the oral Torah from generation to generation. Ibn Ezra refers to them as Matikei Hadat, the transmitters of the law. Another medieval usage of Maitek is for a person who copies from one book to another, or a copist. From there, Maitik also became the term for a person who translates from one language to another, a translator. Hatoke or Hataka is the action of the Maitik or the result of the action. And it is similarly, it similarly stood in medieval uh, times for one, moving or shifting, for example, the shifting of the sun, but also in grammar, the shifting of vowels from letter to letter. Two, Hatoke can also mean simply tradition, the transmission from one generation to the next. Three, Hatoke also means the reincarnation of the soul, of course, Hatoke, from one soul to the next. Four, it can of course mean translation from one language to the other. Five, it means the copying of a text. And hence, six, a single copy or a book. Hatoke is also the word signifying a single copy or an exemplar in Yiddish. In modern usage, these terms, so maitik and hatoke, were gradually replaced by metargem, kirgum, targum in Hebrew, and by iberzetzer or iberzetzung in Yiddish. Nevertheless, maitik remains today, both in Hebrew and in Yiddish contexts, an archaic or traditionalist term for a translator of Sforim of religious books. The biographical dictionary of modern Yiddish literature inaccurately claims that Yavetz, quote, used to sign his works with his own name and with the pseudonym, the Maitik. In fact, uh, well, Sharon here is the expert on pseudonyms. Let's see what she thinks later. But in fact, the epithet Maitik never appears as a real pseudonym, but is usually followed by the titles of the major works that Yavetz translated. Its function of the word Maitek uh, was of legitimization and branding uh, rather than a name use, using uses to disguise the identity as a game or not as a game. So I don't think it's a pseudonym anyway. After accomplishing the translation of the Mishnah in 1880, Yavetz moved to translate Enyakov, Enyankev, a compilation of all Agadic materials in the Talmud with commentaries. It was published in six volumes from 85 to 87. I will stop saying uh, 1800 because I'm we're only in the 19th century. And by translating Enyankev into Yiddish, Moshe Starkman remarks that, I quote, Yavetz translated 30% of the Talmud, the Babylonian, of course. And in addition to that, he inscribed for generations the style, the nusach, of Talmud teaching among East, Eastern European Jews. I actually compared some of Yavetz's translation to recordings of Shirurim, and he is correct. Uh, this is a sort of a recording of how the, the Talmud was taught. Soon after En Yankev, uh, Yavetz published his translation of Midrash, Midrash Rabbe of the Pentateuch and the Five Midilot, printed in 10 parts between 87 and 88. As Yavetz's output increased to monumental proportions, yeah, this is already huge, 
and his reputation grew together with the circulation of his works, so did his own understanding of his translations came to be more clearly pronounced. In the second volume of Midrash Rabbe from 87, Yavetz writes in Hebrew on the back of the title page, and I quote, and because this is not merely a translation, ha'ataka, but is accompanied with a commentary, Peresh, which in the great majority of cases was born in my own mind and through meticulous research in the books that clarify the words of the Mishnah. For this reason, I could wholeheartedly consider this translation as my commentary, Peirush. And as such, it is protected by the laws of his majesty, the emperor, which forbids, who forbids uh, to infringe upon the rights of the author and to print this Midrash Rabbe with this translation, neither in this or in a different graphical layout without my permission. In Yavetz's, end of quote, in Yavetz's conception of author's rights or copyrights, a mere translation, ataka, is a sort of a copy. For the translation to be considered a protected intellectual property, it must be elevated to the degree of a commentary, Perush. At least two titles signed by him, by Yavetz, Shvila Melamdim from 83 and Gdules David Umluches Shoel from 19. One second, why does he want to move here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Gdules David Umluches Shoel from 1911 were adaptations of previous translations. On their title pages, Yavetz's name appears alone as a translator, and the, as the translator, with no and no credit is given to the original translator. This caused future bibliographers both confusion and, of course, antagonism towards Yavetz. And in the case of the pedagogical work Shvile Hamelandim, there is an indication that Yavetz's appropriation has stirred contemporary criticism. For in the preface for the second edition from 1896, Yavetz addresses the question of copyrights, referring the reader to the preface of the original work from 1865, which states that the book may not be copied for 20 years. Even in Yavetz's terms, his first edition uh, of Shvila Melamdim from 83 was a copyright infringement because 20 years did not pass, of course. At any rate, Yavetz felt that his adaptation entitles him to be solely credited as the book's translator. By the end of the 19th century, Yavetz's intellectual property of Ivretaich was so vast that it opened up an opportunity for an even grander enterprise. The ambitious printer Menashe Kadishzon teamed up with Yavetz to publish between 95 and 98 in Warsaw a complete Yiddish translation in five volumes of the entire. Why doesn't it want to move? The entire Chok Israel, an anthology of classical sforim from the Bible through the Mishnah, Talmud, Midrash, and commentaries, all the way to the Kabbalah, the, the Zohar, etc. An immense textual corpus divided into daily portions for self-learning. This is the Chokel in Yiddish, yeah? Chok Israel. In the introduction to the first published volume, Numbers, Kaddish Son uh, writes, and I quote, as the Mishnah and Yankev and Midrash Rabbah have already been translated and well received both in our country and abroad among our brethren, the sons of Israel who fear and all the word of God. So I have spilled gold from my pockets to finance the costs of this grand translation project for the sake of translating all the portions of the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Zohar, moral writings and halacha, according to the Rambam, Zichon Levcha, all of this was translated and nothing remains untranslated by the same translator of the above mentions for him. Also later he, main, he, he mentions the translator who also translated this and this and that, but never gives his name. His authorship, Yavetz's authorship is without dispute, but it is noteworthy that Yavetz is not credited by name in any of the volumes of Chok L'Israel. This can be taken 
I think, as a sign that Yavetz sold his rights to Kaddish Zon, who in turn suppressed the Maitik's name to make sure that he won't claim any copyrights in the future on the basis that his translations are actually, should actually be considered as commentaries, as we have seen before. In 1896, Yavetz translated the Hebrew bestseller uh, Sefer Habris by Pinchas Eliyahu Horowitz, a hodgepodge of history, geography, natural sciences, philosophy, halacha, ethics, and mysticism, a lot of superstitions. The work was venomously, venomously attacked two years later by Yud Lamed Peretz, who concentrated his criticism against the Warsaw printer, Doberich Tursch, for spreading backward obscurantism among his readers. Linguistically, Starkman remarks, Sefer, Habrit, Sefer Habris was written in a much lighter and more idiomatic prose than the scientific popularizations supported by Peretz at the time, which were written in, and I quote, a hard, Germanized, and often unintelligible language. This is Starkman's quote. Between 1903 and 1905, the Vilnius printing house of Yehuda Leib Matz published the Chumash Beis Yehude, a Pentateuch accompanied with a variety of commentaries. It was a great technical typographical achievement and in the words of Starkman, one of the most beautiful specimens of the Jewish printing technique in old Russia and Poland. Among, sorry, not yet. Among the various commentaries printed alongside the biblical text is an Ivritaich version of Rashi's commentary contributed to Yavetz, uh, or contributed by Yavetz. This translation, which is often also called until today Beis Yehude, seamlessly combines the translation of the biblical verse of Rashi's commentary, as well uh, as Yavetz's original interpretations and explanatory notes. While Yavetz's authorship, again, is completely confirmed, he is not credited by name in the volumes themselves, probably for the same reason he was not credited in Chok L'Israel. Therefore, it is difficult to ascertain whether other Ivretaich commentaries included in Chumash, Chumash uh, Beis Yehude, you see it's like there are millions of, of, of texts included in the, in the anthology, uh, it is difficult to ascertain whether others were also authored by Yavetz or not. Besides the books mentioned already, Yavetz published throughout, the, throughout his life dozens of works, large and small, including Shulchan Orech, the Oire Chaim, Medrash Tanchume, Sefer Chupes Chasanim, Sefer Nichum Aveilim, Sefer Shvile Oilem, Sefer Ben Sire, Sipur Nifloes von Groysen Tane Rebbe Akive, Sefer Chochmes Shloime, and many, many, many more. The life and work of Yosef Meir Yavetz provide insights into the profession of translation at the turn of the 20th century, also into the blurry distinctions between translation, adaptation, and interpretation, and into the translation economy in the emerging Yiddish book market in Warsaw. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tal, for, for this, yes. <laughs> Um, for this historical, let's say, uh, approach to the history of translation, yes. Uh, please, uh, commentaries and, and uh, fragis. Uh, Sharon, yes. Sharon, you are muted, please, can you? Yeah, I, I didn't mean to uh, hop, uh a question I just uh, wanted to applaud, but uh, since I've been, <laughs> I do have a question. <laughs> um, so um, in your sense, uh, Tal, um, what would be uh, the main questions that uh, you would um, uh, question um, now, now that you have established the interest of the, <laughs> the person? Yeah, I think the next step, I, you are correct to, to, to point to the fact that there is a next step. This is a, an ongoing research. And 
I'm mostly interested in the textual analysis now, like to, to see exactly what is his approach to translation, how he works as a translator, and to, I, the, I first wanted to establish a biography of this incredible person and completely obscure. Uh, anyone have heard of Yavitz before here? No, right. So I think that first of all, we should know the name. I've been teaching Yavitz actually for years now, and this is how I know him. Uh, in the in the uh, Paris EG Center, and um, yeah, there are actually many 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 questions to ask. Um, of course, textual questions uh, about his style as translator, etc. There are certain things that I'm still not entirely sure about. I mentioned them: the 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 plagiarism, right? The the certain books where it's not entirely clear for me yet how how bold was his misappropriation of of uh, other translators. Um, and, and of course, the most interesting thing maybe for our conference is uh, his own understanding of, of, of glory, of, of credit, of copyrights. And what is it like? The, it seems to me that there's a very pragmatic approach for, for signing your name or not signing your name. It has to do with your pranuse much more than with some kind of a, a project of creating an, like a grand name of a translator that will remain forever. It seems like he did very little to secure his posterity in terms of, of the fact yeah, like we, don't, we don't know his name. Yeah? So um, I will go more into that. Thank you. Uh, Shaul, please. Um, so my question sort of connects this to the the Pinsker translation in some way. I know you haven't done that, maybe you want to do the textual analysis, but I'm curious what kind of performance of orality or some kind of vernacularity is present in the text. So if we think of the Mendel as almost self-parodic in some way, but you'd mentioned very, very like uh, quickly that this actually sounded like the music or the rhythm of how Cheder teaching worked in some way yeah. or Yeshiva, Yeshiva learning lurked. So how, how is, do you have any sort of initial comments of how that worked or how it was reflected yeah. or how it may be complicated by the textuality of the process of hataka that you explained as well. Yeah, you have, you have, I mean, you have this entire um, stylistic formulations like the Gemore Freg, the Gemore Zogt, right? Uh, that, that is not in the text, right? It, 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 it's, it's, a, it's the oral uh, tradition of teaching the Gemore. And this is something that you find in his rendering of the text. Uh, when you read, also not just uh, in Yankev, also uh, Medresh Rabbe, uh, uh, I've done, I've taught mainly Medresh Rabbe in, in, in the Paris City Center. Uh, you see that he, that he really talks to the reader like a teacher, trying to teach and explain in the clearest, and uh, actually he's very, very uh, easy to, to read. I, I recommend uh, also for those who don't, uh, don't have access to, to Hebrew, uh, to read uh, Yavetz, I think that he's clearer than a lot of English translations for, for serious Yiddishists anyway. And, and there is a, absolutely a certain uh, orality um, that has to do with the ped pedagogical approach, yes. And well, I'm also interested, I think we're not there yet. I'm interested, for example, in looking at the text and trying to see where does his translation starts and stops and his own addition, start and stop. And this is something that we've seen with my students. Very often, it is not clear. Very often, you say, oh, wait, wait a second. Now we are in a long excursion in which he explains uh, to the reader something that he thinks the reader should know. And it's not a translation anymore, right? So also, yeah, ontologically, these are coming back to Sharon. The, the ontological questions are the most interesting here. Is it a translation? Is it a commentary? Why is it important to, to define? Etc. Thank you, Tad. Arnaud, please. Sure. S'il te plaît. Yeah, th uh, thank you very much, Tal. It was really interesting. I, 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 I don't, uh, it's the first time I, I hear about him, and I will definitely want to read uh, and to discover him uh, further. Um, I was wondering if there's there are some uh, uh, some signs of modern education in his translation commentaries. If you can see some uh, 
So um, uh, you've talked about the, the superstitious uh, kind of translations he did at the end of the 19th century. Uh, but do you have some some idea of his uh, relationship to, to to modern thinking? So absolutely, but this is also a political question. What is modern education? So when he translates a uh, Sefer Habris, a book that was written at the end of the 18th century, uh, that was all the rage, right? That was an attempt to tell people about Africa and about animals. And like a couple of generations before what we see, for example, with Mendele, with the Dota Teva and all of this, but just with no fact checking. Yeah, it's, it's full of fake news in a sense, right? If you, if you read uh, Peretz's uh, crit criticism, he, his criticism is just to cite it. It's so wacky. Yeah, so for us, it's wacky. For Peretz, it was already wacky in 1900. And for us, uh, 121 years later, it still sounds like this is medieval, but it was not medieval at all. Absolutely. It was completely new. It was a first attempt for, uh, I mean, I don't think it was a first attempt. It was a first attempt in, in the end of the, of the 18th century, maybe. One, like an early attempt to familiarize the reader with concepts, with ideas, with the idea of geography as an idea, right? So I don't think that what motivated Yavetz was by any means a similar and understanding of Bildung or Euklerung, uh, like we have for his, in his contemporaries, in the sense he was uh, um, really in a different time. Um, uh, the, the I don't know how to say the gleichzeitig oder ungleichzeitig, and I'm not sure how to, how do you say that in English. Maybe somebody can can illuminate me. Uh, but um, it seems a bit. Maybe I'm biased that the main, the main motivation here is, is economic, is like what would sell good, what would work. And there was a huge market, both for, um, for his Ivretaichen, uh, for his Hatokes, uh, yeah? and for the pop, like, pfft, yeah, also translations of not very, let's say, of modern Sforim, we can call it like that, popular modern Sforim that were already modern in Hebrew. And in both cases, I think that the main motivation was just what is going to sell, what is going to work. And he worked like crazy. He worked like crazy. He, 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 I, I don't know anybody who managed to produce so much in, so intensively in Yiddish literature. Nobody. And do you have an idea if he reaped the fruit, if he, if he earned money? Um, really, I, I, I don't know. I think that he, when, may, may one indication for him struggling with that is you find ads that he puts in the daily press, in Heint, uh, for example, where he sells directly books, he gives his address. I know he, he lived in Jikagas, for example, at the end of his life. So uh, he gives his address also on some of the books that he publishes. So the fact that he tries to act as a sort of a publisher towards the end of his life seems to me like an indication that he was actually not doing very well. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm not an expert. Uh, it's very, very difficult also to find information, yeah? I've, I've presented to you a sort of a reconstruction of bits and pieces that can be found here and there. Yeah. The Weltstadt of Geld. Uh, a thank Hanna, I hope you can the the frage. Can can I ask you to keep it for the final discussion, please? Because we we are running out of time. Very sorry. So um, um, we will go, we will go to to drink coffee or perhaps milk here in Europe. It's too late uh, for coffee. Uh, we will meet in uh, at um, fifteen. Yes, at a quarter past past six, please. Uh, for a new for. A, for one more fascinating session. So see you.